She was phenomenal. This was my first time at this church, and she just blew me away. I am definitely coming back. What did it evolve to? And by the way, Paul, what is the mind? Nobody knows. I can't tell you what the mind is. I don't know. Nobody really knows. The best we can do is offer you some metaphors. The fact of the matter is, the human mind is the metaphor of all metaphors. The mind is a metaphor for itself. We can think of the dual nature of consciousness here, and we can think in terms of creative and awareness. We can think in terms of being and knowing. We can think in terms of matter and mind. What did you think of her? Paulette was just fantastic, so informative, inspiring, humorous. I just, I loved her speech today. And we create things. We create beauty. Our mind creates that beauty. Here's a perfect example. This was painted by Michelangelo. It's the panel from the Sistine Chapel known as the Creation. It was completed in 1412 under the direction of Pope, Pope Julius II, who had grown tired of slaughtering French people. <laughs> he was getting ready to declare war on the Turks because he ran out of French people to kill. So in a moment of piety, he commissioned Michelangelo to create this magnificent picture on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. And this representation of creation is captured here, and it's a perfect one. And another analogy that we think of, another metaphor we think of when we think of the human mind is the brain. We can't find the mind. We cannot dissect a corpse and find the mind. It isn't there, and so we think in terms of this metaphor of the brain, but the brain is not consciousness. The brain does not create consciousness. Consciousness created that brain, and it uses the brain to manifest itself into this world. Consciousness awareness is that divinity descending, and it does it through the mechanism of the human brain. She was wonderful. If the brain is damaged, what does that mean? Is consciousness damaged? No, it just means that consciousness can no longer use that brain to channel itself into this iteration of creation, into what we see as the reality. The brain allows us to experience reality, and it gives us that capability to channel that, that consciousness that wants to be created, that wants to show up as you, as Jeannie. There she is. There she is, see? <laughs> so how did that happen? How did we come? How did, how did this miracle sitting over here happen? How did this miracle standing here, this biped carbon form, how did that happen? It was magnificent. But life began on this planet some four billion years ago. And at first, the march toward awareness, toward consciousness was held. The vigil, the watch was held by single-celled animals who lived in the ocean. And it took 3.4 billion years for them to organize themselves into multi-celled organisms. And then the march toward evolution began. About 160,000 years ago, humans showed up on this planet. And we all lived in Africa, as far as we can tell. The area around Ethiopia was the birth of civilization right there. That's where we lived. And we evolved in about 25,000 years ago the Neanderthals left this planet to us. You may be surprised to hear that depending on the crowd you're hanging out with, but they died out about 25,000 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> hanging around Jeff, one can wonder. <laughs> they did, and then light-skinned Europeans showed up about 12,000 years ago, and we began to start domesticating dogs, and then something happened. The bicameral mind went away, and we emerged as conscious beings and participants in our own consciousness, in the creation of our own consciousness. That's what happened. But her
public speaking ability is just amazing. We know that this brain, we look at it from two different perspectives, but we understand that it's all one. We understand that there is a unifying force there. And graphically speaking, if we take those images and we happen to overlay them with the one on the other, look what happens. Isn't that astounding? Do you think Michelangelo knew what he was doing when he painted this? Do you think that he understood that although the right brain, the right hemisphere of the brain is responsible for creativity, the frontal lobe up here is responsible for things like language, for things like intuition, for things like spontaneity, for things like judgment, for things like, I, I can't remember, oh, memory. Uh, <laughs> I think you can almost see a little arm coming out of my head right here, can't you? The creative process, it uses the brain to become form and then loses itself in that form. That's astounding, I think. Form is here in our brains, in our minds, in our bodies, but it is everywhere. It is also out here in space. What we are looking at is something called the Pillars of Creation. It is part of the Eagle Nebula and it is 6,500 light years away. This picture was taken a few years ago by the Hubble spacecraft, but what it is looking at is the way this appeared 6,500 years ago. We don't know what it looks like now. We don't know, we'll have to wait 6,500 years to find that out. So we're gonna take a quick break at the end of this. And we'll come back and shut up and go away. Is that good? Good. Come on, come on, no guts. I don't know about your this. Okay, give it over here. These are really incubators for creation. These are huge columns of gas and matter that are swirling around, and they serve as incubators for stars. This is where stars are born. Pockets of this throughout the universe, this is where stars are born. And stars created us. We are the product of stars. The internal temperatures of stars reach somewhere in the range of four million degrees and nuclear fusion occurs. And what happens is when nuclear fusion occurs, those heavy elements occur. The heavy elements that we need to survive, the cadmium, the manganese, the cobalt, the lead, the zinc, the aluminum, iron, all of those things that we need in our body are created on stars. And when they meet your critical mass, which is about 1.5 times the mass of our sun, they explode into supernovas and they shower the entire universe with these life-giving metals. We couldn't be who we are without stars. Who's making the decisions? Who's pulling the strings? Who's making the decisions to create the stars? Well, it's mine. It's the same force that is creating you and me. And it's all the same thing. So we see that mind, universal consciousness, extends throughout the universe. I thought Paulette was funny. She was dynamic she could feel the spirit and it showed up through her in ways that I've never heard before. It's everywhere. It's out in the universe. We see it in nature. There are things in nature that are going on that we don't understand. Things go on all the time that we don't understand. Nietzsche had a wonderful idea when he talked about people doing things that we don't understand. He said, and those who were seen dancing were thought to be insane by those who could not hear the music. I've been in that position. People have thought I was insane. <laughs> you probably do. It's because you can't hear the music that's in my head. <laughs> or the voices, apparently. <laughs> But bees dance. Did you know that? Hey, you know that bees dance? Oh, they boogie their little butts off. They really do. And it's part of their, it's coded in their genetic code. They've been doing it for millions of years, and we're trying to figure out why. Well, it's to supply their hive with pollen. Oh, yeah, that's what they do. They align their little bodies with the sun to show the relative position of pollen from the nest, and then they move their little butts, and they're moving, and they're dancing, and that tells the position, the relative distance to the hive. What a magical 
idea. I mean, you can imagine these little guys running around, right? They're flying around. Oh, 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 I found some pollen. Oh, 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 I better get back to the hive and let them know that. And they come back and they land and then they begin their little dance. Hey, everybody, I've got pollen. <laughs> <laughs> and the other bees are all looking. Oh, she's awful. She is terrible. How clumsy can you get? We got a hundred thousand bees here. Does anybody know how to catch the bee? Anybody? Nobody? Oh God, she's awful. Look at that. She's so clumsy. Six left feet. She's horrible. <laughs> and the other bees are. Yeah, you're right. She really sucks. <laughs> you want to go get some pollen? Yeah, let's go get. Wait a second. You can't move. You can't fly. What are you talking? about it. Fly. I've been flying since I was a lowercase b. I'm little. I've been flying No, you can't fly. Look at your wings. They're too little. They cannot possibly support you. Aerodynamically speaking, you can't fly. Sorry, you're grounded. What are you saying to me? I can't fly. You know I'm riddled with insecurities. I have to wear yellow and black horizontal stripes. It makes me look fatter than I really am. I think I'm retaining water. And you tell me I can't fly. You and I are through. Whatever. You want to go get some pollen? Yeah. And so they fly off and they get some pollen. And there's really a little, there's a moral to this story. You want to know what it is? Let me move it down here and see what it is. Are we ready to hear this? Can you hear me back there? Yeah. There is a moral to this story, and the moral is that bees can dance and fly because no one ever told them they couldn't. <laughs> I have to say that Paulette Jones is one of the funniest women. I have been told that it takes like 37 muscles to frown and like 17 muscles to smile. So I've never been one for a lot of exercise. So I'm going to conserve and I'm going to keep on smiling. <laughs>